Well, we know um, scientists probably don't care too much about muscle size. But when the muscle gets too small, that would be a concern. And there are a lot of conditions um, that would worry people, as shown here, um, particularly related to sports medicine, recovery from disease, aging. And the muscle, when the muscle is not being used, it will decrease. And a lot of physiological and uh, pathologic conditions could cause muscle atrophy, uh, such as bed rest, microgravity, uh, simple bending, or natural disaster that immobilize you. And it's been shown that decreased muscle mass is mainly due to the loss of protein. And that could be controlled by both a decreased protein synthesis and increased protein degradation. But it's been shown that the decrease of, uh, uh, increase of uh, protein degradation plays a major role. There are two ways uh, that controls skeletal muscle uh, protein degradation. One is the autophagic uh, lysosomal pathway, mainly controlled by FOXO. And the other one is, uh, the first one is, as uh, uh, Dr. Rundberg just mentioned, it's mainly for nonspecific uh, damaged large proteins in the cytosol. And the other one is uh, ubiquitin proteolysis pathway, mainly a, a stress pathway controlled by NF-kappa B and uh, inflammation. FOXO controls both pathways. Uh, and the NF-kappa B uh, controls the more specific degradation, but these two merge uh, to some specific uh, enzymes that degrade muscle protein. Namely, one is atrogen one, one is BRF one, and these two are uh, ubiquitin E3 ligases and they target specific muscle proteins, such as troponin I, myosin light chain, and heavy chains, actin, and those are important in muscle contraction, and when they lose, you cannot move. And PGC1, why PGC1? PGC1 inhibits both FOXO and NF-kappa B pathway, and this could decrease the loss of protein and more importantly, because inflammation also would promote the expression of some of the inflammatory cytokines, such as TNR-alpha interleukin-6, that cause NF-kappa B activation, that could escalate the, the problems. And PGC1, of course, is promoting mitochondrial biogenesis, reduce oxidative stress, uh, which is also an activator of uh, inflammation. So we look at the uh, PGC1 expression is controlled by many factors, including hormones, contraction, and they promote not only the gene expression of PGC1, but also the phosphorylation, and which makes it active. And interestingly, mitochondrial production of reactive oxygen species is also uh, controlling PGC1 expression and the phosphorylation. So we hypothesize uh, if these um, hormones, contractional, uh, and production of hydrogen peroxide in the mitochondria uh, is decreased when muscle is immobilized, we hypothesize that PGC1 will be downregulated, and eventually it could affect its, the muscle's uh, energy production and uh, causing muscle damage. So the question is, does muscle immobilization cause muscle, uh, atrophy and mitochondrial det deterioration due to the PGC1? So we designed some simple experiment. Uh, there are a lot of ways to immobilize muscle. Uh, in the mouse, a simple way is to put a cap around the hind limb, one of the hind limb, to fix the ankle and the joint, uh, and the knee and the ankle joint. And that doesn't restrict the other limb movement and the whole body movement. And we 
subject the rats to uh, mouse to two weeks of immobilization. And we're also interested in the remobilization to see if uh, uh, remobilization, how quick the muscle can recover from immobilization. And the result is for both uh, the lower limb muscles, TA, muscle tibialis anterior, and the gastric nemius, you can see that 20% of loss uh, due to two weeks of immobilization. And we extend it uh, to 19, 20 days. It doesn't cause much further increase. So it's a, it's a nice 20%, but not too long to cause uh, further damage. Control to the contralateral legs. And after five days of remobilization, there's not a whole lot of muscle recovery. Of course, if you extend it longer, it will recover. But we're interested in how quick the muscle can recover. So look at PGC1 expression. It's decreased by half after two weeks. And some of the PGC1 control the product, NRF1 and RF2 are both downregulated. And remobilization for five days doesn't cause much recovery of this. And we look at some of the uh, target genes for PGC1, uh, cytochrome C, is downregulated. We would expect COX-4, one of the target genes for PGC1, uh, nuclear encoded gene, but it's really surprising that it wasn't changed. That's the only product that wasn't affected by um, immobilization, and we don't know why. TFAM, uh, one of the major uh, product of uh, PGC1, which controls mitochondrial proliferation, so we look at mitochondrial DNA to nuclear DNA ratio, it's dramatically decreased. So mitochondria is not proliferating, it's decreased. We look at cytochrome C oxidase, and enzyme activity is a functional marker, and it's downregulated and recovered somehow, but um, not a huge increase. Then another functional marker is the ATP production. So we look at the mitochondrial ATP production rate, that was increased about 30%. And remobilization for five days doesn't give a quick recovery. So these are interesting data because we would expect oxidative stress, ROS production to, de to increase with immobilization, but it is not. It's not increased until the muscles are remobilized. So this is remind of us of some effect of ischemia reperfusion. Um, we don't know what causes this increase and hydrogen peroxide and also lipid peroxidation by uh, eight isoprestin as a marker. Immobilization caused some overexpression of inflammatory cytokines, such as TN-alpha, interleukin-6, and it's sustained through the remobilization stage. So this is uh, also consistent with some of the NF-kappa-B activation. We don't have to introduce NF-kappa-B. And again, this is con consistent with the hydrogen peroxide data, the phosphorylation of R-kappa-B and IKK are not increased until the remobilization phase. And this is part of the uh, P60, P70, uh, P60, P50, P65 uh, data, and you can see that the nuclear accumulation of P65 doesn't occur until remobilization. As I uh, uh, mentioned, the two muscle-specific uh, ubiquitin ligase, atrogen-1 and uh, MRF-1, and they are increased in three major muscles in the hind limb, um, TA, gastrocnemius, soleus, and only uh, MRF1 returned, uh, not to the resting level, but still elevated, but decreased. Atrogen 1 remained to be activated, even during the remobilization. So as the first summary, that muscle immobilization can cause increased proteolysis, 
and muscle uh, loss associated with decline of mitochondrial biogenesis and inflammation. And downregulation PGC1 uh, seems to play a major role in muscle disease uh, atrophy. So how do we um, improve uh, the situation? Well, um, exercise training has been shown a major way, but for remobilization, immobilization, we cannot exercise train the rats or the animals. So we have to find alternative ways. And one of the ways is to transfect the muscle directly. Um, transgenic model has advantage, but for muscle, um, to transfect the, the entire body, uh, one is it's only available in in animals, not in a human, and also it's not muscle specific. So the way we uh, choose to do is the local muscle injection of PGC1 DNA. And first we transfected the E. coli and overexpressed them. We harvested the PGC1. We tested first in the C2C12 muscle lines to be sure it's overexpressed. Then we move on to inject into the TA muscle. We picked the PA because it's a very thin muscle and it's, it's easier to show the, uh, the even overexpression. Uh, and, and also it's uh, one of the muscles that controls the uh, ankle flex uh, extension. And we uh, went through a few steps to be sure that PGC1 is expressed. And also we used a uh, reporter gene of cytochrome C um, uh, as a uh, attached to a recipient case to be sure that PGC1 is expressed in the TA muscle. So the muscle is injected, then electroporated to be sure that um, the TNA penetrate the muscle evenly. And we look at the PGC1 expression. And that was successful. Uh, PGC1, of course, is overexpressed both in the controls and also the muscles subject to immobilization and remobilization, as I just presented. 15 days immobile and five days remobile. A decrease and increase of PGC1, both in the whole muscle and the nuclear uh, levels, is increased. Uh, NR1 is overexpressed. And for some reason, uh, NF1 and NF2 are not elevated accordingly uh, to PGC1. We don't know why. But TFAN was increased by PGC1 overexpression and also cytochrome C, as we showed before. Nice thing about mitochondrial proliferation as um, the, the decrease of of mitochondrial DNA was elevated um, to about 50% by the, the overexpression of PGC1, and so is uh, ATP production rate. Now, this is a small, but it's a very significant uh, in, in terms of functional uh, implication because the ATP is important for muscle uh, movement and other functions. And we look at uh, the oxidative stress markers. Uh, the hydrogen peroxide production is increased with the protocol, but with the overexpression of PGC1, uh, hydrogen peroxide is decreased. Two other enzymes, which may also contribute to oxidative stress, uh, NADPH oxidase, xanthine oxidase, they are both increased with the protocol and they are not responding to PGC1 overexpression. So the, the mitochondria PGC1, I mean hydrogen peroxide, is specific um, because of the PGC1 overexpression. Use the 4 hydroxynoninol as a marker, and lipid peroxidation is decreased because of PGC1 overexpression. So we look at uh, the oxidative stress, uh, such as uh, NF-kappa-B and uh, TNR-alpha, interleukin-6. NF-kappa-B binding is decreased uh, because of the overexpression of PGC1. 
And so is interleukin-6 uh, production, but not TN-alpha. We measured the antioxidant enzyme expression because uh, some of the, the work showed that PGC1 controls antioxidant enzyme expression. So we measured SOD, P GPX catalase, and none of the protein levels is affected by either immobilization, remobilization, or by PGC1 overexpression. However, when you measure SOD2 enzyme activity, they are increased by PGC1. So what is the mechanism? Well, uh, previous talkers about um, CERT1 and CERT3 are uh, very important. And the acetylase, uh, the acetylase controls uh, in part of uh, um, SOD, the acetylation. So you can see that because PGC1 overexpression upregulate uh, CERT3 level, so you can see the decrease of acetylation of SCOD2. And this is probably uh, explains why SOD2 enzyme activity is increased uh, because the acetylation is decreased uh, due to the overexpression of PGC1. So as a summary of the second experiment, PGC1 overexpression uh, through the local DNA transfection reverses in part uh, immobilization, remobilization effect by enhancing mitochondrial biogenesis and also um, reduced inflammatory markers and oxidative stress. And this protection uh, may be partly explained by the increase of CERT3 expression uh, because the increase of SOD2 level would remove um, possible oxidative damage to the mitochondria and inactivation and uh, reduces NF-kappa-B induced inflammation. Um, so this is uh, uh, quite encouraging, but uh, the last study uh, I'm going to talk a little bit is about aging. Uh, this is quite a different model because uh, aging is not immobilization, but we know that as people get aged, uh, their movement level decreases, so we want to make uh, an comparison to see if PGC1 plays a role in the age-related downregulation of mitochondrial function and uh, oxidative stress. We know that as muscle get aged, uh, not only the mass decrease, aerobic capacity decrease, and um, our previous talkers talked a lot about uh, the aging effects. So we looked at uh, rats with age. So when we compared, um, I believe those are four weeks, uh, four months versus the 22 month old rats. And there's a significant decrease of both the mRNA levels and the protein levels of PGC1. Just give the rats a mild exercise training program, like 15 minutes per day, 10% grade, uh, grade for 45 days per week, five weeks. These are not stressful running, slow running. And that reverses, uh, not only reverses the decline of age-related PGC1 level, but also making them higher than the, the resting controls. Uh, so we can make an argument that uh, some of the uh, decline PGC1 is not by aging per se, but by the decreased uh, muscle activity. And you can reverse it by increasing muscle activity. And we looked at the TFAM uh, mRNA levels and the TFAM uh, protein levels. Uh, you can see that both, in both cases, the mRNA levels and, and the, the protein uh, training reverses the, the aging effect. And when you look at mitochondrial uh, DNA expression, again, cytochrome C as a marker 
um, by training, they can both upregulate these and reverse some of the aging effect. Uh, we looked at some of the uh, upper stream enzymes, such as AMPK, P38, and uh, we found that um, the active form of uh, uh, AMPK is increased. Uh, these are the, the open bars of the phosphorylated AMPK is increased by exercise training in old rats. And the P38, the active form of P38, also increased by um, exercise training in old rats. And uh, CERT3, uh, CERT1 is also upregulated by training. So when we look at uh, some of the binding data of uh, CRAB uh, DNA, uh, because both enzymes uh, would merge to CRAB phosphorylation, and we can see that um, the binding data, that training increased um, the old rats in terms of their um, CRAB binding and possibly explains the PGC1 overexpression. So uh, as a summary, the mitochondrial content and function, a decrease in old, old muscle, an impaired PGC1 expression and signaling may underline part of the etiology of sarcopenia. And exercise training upregulates mitochondrial biogenesis despite of old age, partly due to the adaptation of the PGC1 signaling pathway in some of the upper stream enzymes. So finally, I want to acknowledge uh, some of the students and the postdoctors and the collaborate, collaborators for this study. Thank you very much. Yes, Kevin. Thank you very, very interesting talk, Lily. Um, you said something very early on uh, that intrigued me when, when you said that some of the responses you were seeing looked almost as if there was an ischemia reperfusion effect uh, with, with the banding of, of the leg. And I'm wondering if it's, if it's possibly a muscle blood flow uh, problem in that, as you know, you know very well, muscle blood flow is dependent upon uh, muscle activity to a large extent to keep blood flowing through through arteries and ve through veins to backflow. So I'm wondering if in the banding you're limiting blood flow enough that you're getting a hypoxia, not anoxia, but a hypoxia, and then that's followed by a, a better uh, perfusion and, uh, and a similar, similar effect of reperfusion after you've removed the band. Well, that's, that's a very good point. So uh, all the immobilization models have some limitation and advantage. This model, um, has two problems. One is what you said. We, we are not trying to cap it too tight right. to really restrict the blood flow. But inevitably, when the muscle is not moving, the blood flow will decrease. And when you release, there might be an ischemia reperfusion effect. We haven't uh, measured it, but xanthine oxidase is increased uh, by this protocol, indicating that this alone may cause um, some free radical damage. The other thing we received was uh, some comments was uh, in this model, the, the ankle was in a slightly extended uh, mode, so this TA muscle is slightly stretched. Mm. That could also uh, put some stress in this model and make it downregulate further than the physiological level. Thank you for the comments. Peppy. I have the same kind of question as Kelvin, but in a slightly different tone. We are using, I mean, this was not prepared. <laughs> we are using a similar protocol, but instead of banding, we are using not immobilization, by, but um, loading and unloading. So, for the animals that unload. Uh, hind limb suspension? Yeah. yeah. When they are reloaded, they are in such a bad state that the veterinarian will not allow us to repeat the experiment. So this might be something very serious when you reload, and we're not banding the animal, we're just, uh, and, and, and we're having difficulties in trying to repeat the experiment because the veterinarian will not let us. Uh, and so I, I think we have to think about this, there must be something really, when you reload and enable the, the, the blood flow, or enable the, the, the importance of 
acid conducting itself rather than on the, on the matter. Well, this also reminds me the space flight because in some of the early uh, studies we got involved, it's the returning to the Earth that causes oxidative stress and a lot of oxidative damage. Now, the flight itself doesn't seem to bother them that much. So, maybe related that was mechanism. Reloading, right? Yeah, reloading. It's reloading. Um, I had a question very similar to Kelvin, and you, and you can't be answer it, but um, did you ever measure hypoxia in, in the tissue? I think his question was is this a hypoxia driven event? And did, so, did you measure tissue hypoxia anymore? No, uh, the, the quick answer is no. We didn't measure uh, how pox hypoxic these tissues are. Um, this model probably combines several different physiological stress, including decreased blood flow may cause decreased oxygen supply. But gene expression induced by, by HIF1 or a similar transcription factor will cause very similar effects to what you see. This is possible. We, we haven't checked. We have to test it out. <laughs> Thanks.